Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special event this afternoon. My name is Audra Johnston. I'm from International Students and Scholars, and we want to thank you for joining us for a special event this afternoon. We are joined by a friend of the office, Mr. Art Saratelli. And um, Art has done uh, seminars for us before. He is an immigration attorney and he has a lot of knowledge to share with you. Um, so I will hand things over to him. And Art, please tell us about yourself and go for it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, <laughs> what I do, I, I found that while working in immigration law, the overlooked in my opinion the overlooked population was the student and you know bachelor's master's phd the student who got all the way through the f1 or the j1 status and then they got work authorization after graduation and then what and then what so the way most people get information about and then what is they are students either employed and the employer has a lawyer, which is okay because you don't have to pay. Uh, sometimes the lawyer for the company or the employer pays more attention to the employer and they forget about you and it's your life. So that that's a little, you know. Um, um, but, 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 but more importantly, you're normally kind of left on your own to figure it out. And you go to a local lawyer, you got to pay to sit in their office and ask questions. And then after you pay, you leave. And then what if you have another question? You got you to go, you gotta go back and pay again. So we just determined, in other words, we don't do what everybody else does. If everybody else is here, we're over here. So what's over here? <laughs> just giving out answers with no fee. We don't charge you for answers. So if you need information to make the next right intelligent decision about your immigration status in America after after Audra's office gets you all the way through to OPT or academic training, then um, you could email us uh, and we will we'll answer your questions to a degree where it's general enough. We're not giving you real specific legal advice about what to do next and what papers to file, but we're giving you broad overall options that we can figure out how the options in the immigration system available uh, can solve your problems. And so I'll turn on the slides and I'll show you what I am talking about. Um, and then you could, um, take a screenshot of the, the slide about uh, my contact information. Because we're not kidding, you, you contact us tomorrow, a year from tomorrow, some students, some students graduate with bachelor's degrees and they call me eight years from tomorrow and, and they have PhDs when they call. So just um, no, we're not kidding, we're not kidding, we'll, we'll help you. Um, so we're talking today about career planning and using work visa choices after OPT. And there are 12 popular choices, 12 of them. And the one you might hear the most about is a cap covered, cap subject. Cap meaning it's capped, it's a limit, there's a quota. Um, the H-1B with a quota and because there's not enough supply in the quota, they hand them out by lottery. And that kind of is uh, rotten. It's awful because uh, if you don't win the lottery, you can't even apply for one. And if you do win the lottery, you still have to apply and you still have to be approved. So it's an extra headache. But, but again, someone has to win. So if you have an employer willing to put you in line for an H-1B with a lottery, do it do it if they're if, if they're interested and willing and able do it someone has to win someone has to win but what happens if you don't and to give you an idea of the odds a half a million people approximately every year a half a million people want one of the limited number of h1bs and the limited number is eighty-five thousand. 
So they distribute 85,000 H-1Bs every year among the people who want them, who number into the half million range. Good luck with that. So um, that's what we do. That's where we found the need, the greatest the headlines are all about the border, the border, the border. People are sneaking in. No one's taking jobs coming over the border. Over the border, those folks want a better way of life. You know, they want to um, um, make money for their children's future. Um, and they work in jobs Americans don't want to do. You want to work in a poultry farm? You want to, sla you want to slaughter a animals to make st uh, steaks that you say, see in the grocery store? Do you want to pick strawberries? Americans certainly don't. So, so the real problem isn't the border. I mean, it's a mess at the border. Don't get me wrong. But the real problem is helping you all. And until they change the law, all we got is what I'm going to show you. Um, now, there, this is the contact information. So we have the two email addresses. Um, mine is art at SM Immigration Law. S for Saratelli, M for Mial. Mara would be Mara at SM Immigration Law. But all my email, no matter how it comes in, always winds up in the Gmail account because that's where I can share documents with you. And you, if you're a, a PhD post postdoc researcher or a PhD that's going to be a postdoc, uh, I, I, I can look at your documents, your articles, your journal articles, and other evidence you might have. You can just upload it to a common file that we share. So this is our office cell phone. This is the two email addresses. No matter which one you use, you'll always get an answer back from this one, immigration.art at gmail and this is our website click on all the links all the links are live so if you click on that there, there you'll get our website um so click on all the links and let's go back over here um here we go now this is my resume basically i'm a business oriented uh immigration lawyer i didn't come up through the liberal arts in hindsight that probably would have learned a lot more about life if I studied liberal arts, but I went down the business route. But in any event, working in businesses at, at least now helps me understand how to run the actual law firm that my law partner and I have. So that was, that was good. And everybody's your age. See, when I say we really focus on the student graduate, there they all are. They're all right there, and they're all your age, and everybody is fun, and uh, uh, um, they're enthusiastic about the future. They're not looking back. You're my age. You, some people look, look back with regret. I don't have any time for regret. This lady with the coffee has no time for regret. They're all looking forward to the future. This young lady is a dental student at the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League. I mean, Ivy League educated dentist, and she's at a rave. Don't even ask me what she's doing there or after she was there. But all I know is she's very smart, very conscientious, and everyone is fun. They're all fun. This is a maxiofacial surgeon. Uh, this is a PhD in mathematics. This guy is into Bitcoin. I mean, it, just smart, young people. Uh, this is how you reach us all over the internet. And this is the really the first big picture slide, big picture. How do you get a green card if that's your goal? A green card is permanent residence. And you may have heard the fuss about the intention behind a visa. So an F1 or a J1 student visa is a temporary intent visa. You come here for a specific reason, and then you do what you're supposed to do, study. And then maybe if you want to work after you graduate, you can also do that as a student. But then you got to go because students come, study, work, and go. The work visas which come after you finish your post-graduation work they're the link between the temporary work visa and 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 the permanent green card so permanent residency is the green card 
And if you want to get one of those, there's two major ways students get there. One is through employment, using your education that you've earned in America. You graduate, you get OPT, then you get a work visa, which is the transition between the temporary and the permanent residency. And there's 12 of these work visas. And the H-1B with the lottery is the most talked about one, but by no means is it necessarily the best one. For example, there's an H-1B without a lottery. What's that all about? I'll tell you. And then the second way is through family-based, meaning marriage. Uh, you can marry an American and you're guaranteed, not guaranteed, but the way the processing has been going, you marry an American, you get from marriage to the green card in a year, one year. Up here, it's based it the wait time. It The wait time is based on the country where you're born. Down here, the country where you're born only applies for the wait time if you're trying to get a green card through a spouse you marry and the spouse you marry has a green card then the country where you're born comes into play regarding how long you have to wait if you marry an american now i'm not just <laughs> don't go out and like uh hand out cards i'd like to marry an american please that that's fraud marriage fraud's bad don't do that but if you're in already in love with an american the American spouse brings the benefit of you just get in line and about a year later you get a green card. So if you're just for example, an Indian born student, Indian born, and you want to get a green card from the minute you get in line for the green card, you could wait up to 12 years, 12 years. One more time. 12 years if you're indian born if you're born anywhere else in the world except mainland china the wait time is around two three years and coincidentally if you have a stem major you're in this box for two or three years there is no rule no rule there might be employer policies those are rules that will affect you in employer policy. But there is no legal rule. There is no law that says you must work on OPT first and then get a work visa in order to get in line for the green card. It's not sequential. You can do these things in parallel. What do you need to get a green card? All the credentials required required to do the job you'll do when you get the green card. So the green card is based on a job. If the job description requires certain credentials, when you have those credentials, you can apply. So if you have those credentials, when you graduate, get in line. If the employer will let you get in line for this way back here. Now you have all this time ticking away while you're already in line for this. And if you get the extra time in this box, you may very well leave this box and get the green card and never, never, ever need one of these visas if everything goes swimmingly, everything goes wonderfully, everything goes according to your plan, that could happen, um, except if you're born in India or mainland China. The wait for mainland China to get a green card is about uh, four, five, six years. It varies. Uh, India is the longest. Mainland China is in the middle. And then everyone else in the world, wherever you're born, it's, it's somewhere on the other end of the extreme spectrum. Um, so if you're an Indian-born person and you marry an American, it's a one-year wait. Your birth country, your birth country, doesn't, it's irrelevant. It's the American spouse that's the relevant factor in the weight. All right, so that's picture number one. The most important thing, I guess, is you do not have to wait to get in line for the green card until you're here in this box. 
you can start way back here if an employer will be willing to do that for you. Um, now, what's involved in getting a green card through marriage? You get married. But what's involved in getting a green card through employment? Well, there's different kinds of employment. There's employment where your employer sponsors you for the green card. And these categories are stratified as employment-based first preference or employment-based second preference, employment-based third preference, employment-based fourth preference, and these stratified categories um, vary according to what kind of green card you are eligible for. M many students put themselves in more than one green card line, meaning, meaning if you have a PhD, this quadrant up here is for PhDs. If you have a master's degree, you could slip into this box right here but basically this up here the four corners that i've pulled out separately these four are for phds if you don't want to rely on your post um yeah well if you don't want to rely on your employer after you graduate with a phd meaning a postdoc can't cannot get you a green card because postdocs are temporary jobs meaning meaning they're funded by grant money and when the grant money goes away your job goes away with it but the postdoc can get you an h1b work visa the postdoc can get you this but it cannot get you that so if you have a lot of uh scientific uh publications uh, presentations at conferences. They could also be business related, business presentations, business research papers. You have a PhD. You could um, get an H-1B through university postdoc work. And if you don't want the university um, to help because they're going to tell you, oh, it's postdoc, we can't help, then you can get your own green card. You could sponsor yourself in this category. Some people work for research and development in a company. You work for a company, they will sponsor you for a green card if they love you and you're doing really well, but, but for them to determine how much love they have for you could take two years or three years and you're just wasting time. So a lot of PhDs that work for private companies, they get in line for one of these self-sponsored green cards and they're working on OPT and they pray that after two years, the employer puts them in line for a green card, usually this one, the, the employer puts them in line for the green card, but they've already been in line because they put themselves in line back here or over here. And what I would do if you ever called me for advice is before I just answer a question, that presumes you know what's wrong and you're asking the right question. I would figure out with you where you fit into this chart and then figure out if you fit into more than one box on this chart and we'll put you in the right box and figure out how to get the stuff you need to, to win a green card in one of these boxes. And when you're waiting for a green card, you do need some underlying status to stay here. So normally the underlying status is one of these work visas. You stay here or OPT, that's another one of the underlying statuses that keep you here waiting while you're in line for the green card. Um, and we could ask questions about this in the q and I'm trying to save maybe 30, 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, but I don't know how that's going. <laughs> I'm not very far into the presentation. If if you um, want a national interest self-sponsored green card, Joe Biden said, you know, why are we making it so hard for students to determine if what they're doing is in the national interest? Why does every case have to prove from ground zero that the work is important and it's important all over America for America. Why don't we just tell people what we're looking for as a nation? And if they study or work in one of these areas, they've already gotten half the case 
approved. You just have to have the, the remaining half argued in an application. So you click here and Joe Biden is gonna tell us what are the emerging technologies that are critical for the United States' national interest. And you'll see how it skews, it skews toward the sciences. Um, and here's a list of all the areas of study that could get you like uh, the steroid supercharge candidate in the national interest waiver category for self-sponsored green card. Um, now, what do these things mean? This is awfully broad biotechnology. What? Uh, uh, hypersonics? Huh? What are they talking about? So then Joe Biden said, well, let's tell them a little more information. So biotechnology would be these sub bullets. If you're in any one of these sub bullets, you're going to be in biotech. But say you study nanoscience, material science. Well, there is no material science. There is no nanoscience bullet. So your discipline will be hidden among the words describing each of the bullets. So you got to really study this list and more people than you would think fall into one of these STEM categories. You'd be really, you'd be really surprised. And I can help you figure that out as well. I mean, I really love this. I got nothing going on. My children are grown. Look at me. I'm an old, I'm an old guy. My wife doesn't want to even talk to me half the time. My children don't listen to me. So I could talk to somebody's children. I'll talk to you. I, I love it. If, I, if we get you, if we get you the visa or the green card or both that you need to accomplish your goals in America, then for me, that's like winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> I got nothing going on. That's exciting for me. And it's exciting for you because you'll find a, an eccentric person who will listen to your story and actually really try to help. And you won't get a bill unless we're the ones who do the application for you. Um, um, and then you, you can see they're all spelled out. So take a look. Um, all right, enough of that. Let's go back. Um, now this, okay, what, what is this chart? Just real quick. The most popular boxes in the work-based employment green card choice strategy um, or structure is the purple box. The purple box is what normal, regular jobs require. You have to go to the Department of Labor and prove now that you're here permanently or that you're going to be here permanently which is this box, not up here. These are temporary. You don't have to tell the Department of Labor anything up in this box, except for the H-1Bs, how much you're gonna be paid. Because um, the Department of Labor worries about labor rates, depressing labor wages, and protecting the American workforce. So they only drag the Department of Labor into the visa box up here for the H-1B. Down here, they drag Department of Labor in because we're asking as a company, as a sponsor, to let someone stay in our workforce permanently. And then we have to make sure there's no American who lives nearby who wants that job and, and, and who could do the job. So that's what these purple boxes are, the process where you bring in the Department of Labor. So why do I show you this? First of all, I'm telling you, don't tell your employer about any of this, they will freak out if they don't know it already. So big, big companies, Walmart, J.B. Hunt, um, um, all, all, all the big technology, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Walmart, they all know the immigration rules inside and out. They know this. And they will have a policy of when they will put you in line for a green card and what kind of green card they'll put you in line for. Uh, Walmart, for example, or Google, you lose the H-1B lottery because there's only 85,000 H-1Bs. You lose the lottery. You can't even stay here after OPT. You got to go. So thank goodness, multinational corporations, Walmart, um, Google, 
Louis Vuitton, um, um, the, 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 the TD Bank uh, from Canada, they will put you in line for a green card up in this box because you'll be a multinational transfer e manager. So make you a project manager after OPT. You've been in training, OPT. You lose the H1B lottery. They'll send you to an outside the American continent work um, office. They have either overseas in Singapore or over the border in Canada or Mexico. And you work outside America for a year. And when you come back, because the requirement is to be a multinational transfer e manager, you need to be a person who has worked for a company outside America for a year. And then you come back and you're in an L1A category, not the H1B. And there is no lottery for the L1A. So if you're Indian born and you work for a multinational on OPT and you lose the lottery and they love you, if you're at Walmart and you lose the lottery, this could be the best day of your life because they'll send you, they'll say, hey, come here. You're in logistics. You're in logistics. You want to go work for us in Singapore for a year, maybe a little more, and we'll train you in Singapore about what we do there as part of the supply chain, and you'll be closer to the source of the goods, China, and um, or, or Southeast Asia, and we'll have you work there and then bring you back. And when we bring you back, this is all after your OPT, we'll bring you back not as an H, the heck with that lottery, we'll bring you back as an L. And then you could just stay here at headquarters in Bentonville and live happily ever after. And once you're up in this box, if you're Indian born, the wait in this box is not 12 years. No, no, it's four or five years in this box because you're up a level. You're not in this EB2 second rate line. You're in the top line and you don't have to go through all this crazy extraordinary ability self-sponsorship nonsense. You just get a regular old job like a regular old person with a multinational. So my tip to you, multinational, multi, multinational, multinational, have a list of employer possibilities where you'll target your job search and make sure multinationals are on the list. DHL, that's another one. Um, all right, enough. And this is what goes on in that box. Now, why did I leave it here? Because even though um, um, Amazon and uh, Walmart know what goes on in this box, they are the exception. Most mid-size employers, most mid-size employers don't know anything about this box. And if and if they don't know, but they're willing to talk to me, I'll explain things on your behalf with you. On the phone call will be me, you, your manager. And then, and then I don't charge for any of that. And the manager can ask me questions. So he's not relying on some kid to tell him about his own immigration law. I'll tell him, but I'll tell him in a way that doesn't give him a heart attack. I'll tell him in a way that he doesn't have an aneurysm and his, and his brain vessel, uh, a blood vessel in his brain bursts and drops dead during the phone call. I won't do that. Nobody will die during the phone call. And that's because I will sugarcoat this. This is what you do in a straightforward manner. Your actions are to enroll in school, graduate, apply for OPT, and then apply for a follow-on work visa. The green card is all this activity in this line. And this green card can start as soon as you have the credentials, meaning all the way back here at graduation. Um, so they go in parallel. And then down here is what your status is and when you gain a permanent footing in our society based on this crazy middle timeline. And you'll see you're going to be in the work visa status all the way over to here. And if you go up, ah, this tells me you have no solid permanent foot on our soil in America until you file the darn I-485, which is your green card application for the actual green card. So you got to be patient. You do. 
And while you're being patient, there's a lot of waiting, sitting around doing nothing and no communication and you get anxious. That's why we're there to tell you what's going on, that it's perfectly normal. Our system is inefficient and I know you're anxious, but don't be, don't be anxious. And here's why. And I can relate to anxiety because I'm, look at me, I'm tightly wound. Uh, I got it in my genetics. I'm, I'm a Mediterranean Italian, Southern Italian to make it even worse where there's, they believe in witchcraft and evil eye and that my grandmother would pull a knife on my grandfather and throw dishes. It's not good. There's, some, there's something in the water in the Mediterranean that makes everybody who's from a country that touches the Mediterranean, they're all crazy. So I'm crazy. And my craziness manifests itself in anxiety. So you want to be anxious? Come to the expert. <laughs> I'll tell you not to be. And then maybe you can tell me when not to be. We'll trade information. Um, okay, now if you want to get married, here's the uh, uh, video YouTube playlist about the different topics of marriage. So take a look at that. And literally you click there and you get the actual YouTube channel. And it looks just like that because I'll send you to the playlist. Um, now, this is the crux of the whole thing. How do you combine your job search planning with the temporary work visa categories with the eye toward getting OPT, getting a job offer for OPT that will lead to a work visa without a lottery, without a, without a component of luck? How do you do that? Because you need, if you don't get, again, if you don't get the green card when you're in this box and you want a green card, you only got one other box to go to, the 12 work visa choice box, the, the bridge. So if you leave OPT and you don't have a green card yet, you've got to use the bridge. And in the bridge, you've got three path, 12, 12 pathways, and here they are. So I'll go over all these with you using my words, but just to show you how the rest of the slides are organized, these are 12 categories. I have some information on job searching. Then I take that oval, I number each one of the categories, and then I have detailed slides that are number correlated back to the oval. So here's all about the first choice. And there's a lot of slides because it's a crazy, crazy category with a lottery. Um, choice two is the H-1B with no lottery, no quota. And that, just to show you, is the second one right there. And then there's a G visa. What the heck is that? That's good for engineers, uh, public health policy majors, public health, engineers, finance. What's that? Well, those are the folks who get jobs, number three, here um, with international organizations, which are a subset of NGOs. These international organizations are such, such special NGOs. Our government made a whole separate list of them, and it's a 10-page PDF list, two columns per page, and you find that list right there, and we'll go and take a look at that. But that's how all the slides are, are organized by number. And there's usually the definition of the, the category. And then I put USCIS descriptions in addition to my bullets. And maybe if I've made a video about it, we'll put the video, click it, and you'll, you'll go see what I have to say about it. Um, all right, so that's how the slides work with the oval. But let's go back to the first appearance of the oval. The things to keep in mind are how to use this chart. You got to plan your job search backwards from the available visas, meaning if the H-1B number one up here is limited by a lottery and you get one strictly by chance, you might want to take matters into your own hand and reduce the risk level, reduce the level of chance chance ruining your life, you, you take chance out of it as much as possible by picking one of the remaining 11. Now, everyone in the presentation, everyone 
who's a citizen of any country on earth is eligible for the top five, the bottom four, that's nine. And these three categories in gray vary by your country of citizenship. Now, wait a minute. Why am I talking about citizenship? Didn't I just say the green card waiting time is based on where you're born? Yes, but the country of birth, while it determines your weight for the green card, the country of birth does not determine which of these you are eligible for. Your country of citizenship determines your work visa option availability your country of citizenship. So everybody's citizenship gets you a shot at the top five and the bottom four. These three in the gray vary by citizenship. So number one, which work visas are available based on your citizenship? So for example, I'm a guy with an Indian passport, but as luck would have it, my mother was working in the UAE, and I was born in the UAE. What does that mean for me? It means I'm a citizen of India, so my visa choices are limited by which ones an Indian citizen can get. But when it comes to waiting for the green card, I'm not Indian. I'm not going to be waiting 12 years. I was born in the UAE. My wait time is two or three years. I'm one of those rare Indian citizens who wasn't born in India, and I can get the heck out of this box in three years if I have a STEM major. How crazy is this? You need like a PhD in logic to just to figure this garbage out. And I learned it all on the job, like a plumber. <laughs> I was a plumber's apprentice for years, and now I know this. Um, so what citizenship lets you pick which ones of these are relevant to you? All right now, now what does that mean? Relevant to you? Well, what's your major? What what are your employment goals? Do you want to work for a multinational? Do you want to be a ballet dancer? Do you want to be a pharmacist? Do you want to be a a, um, a supply chain analyst at Walmart? What do you want to do? Do you want to be a religious worker? You could study supply chain and figure out how to get a religious organization's missions work in disaster relief, you could be part of that organization's supply chain, getting the medical supplies from the manufacturer all the way to the people caught, caught in the rubble of an earthquake. And you could do that under the umbrella of a religious organization. There's so many ways to beat this system. I can't even tell you. You're, we're, we're only limited by your imagination. Your imagination plus mine is the only limit and then the other limit is the level of apathy the people that advise you exhibit. And I am not apathetic. I take this as seriously as, a, as an aneurysm. I really, really, really do not want anybody's child who's halfway around the world to feel isolated and alone because this stuff makes no sense. And you can't really learn it on your own completely because the internet has all kinds of contradictory stuff. And then the lawyer down the road wants to charge you $300 just to talk. We don't do that. You're human beings, you have human dignity. And if we don't treat you like that, then shame on us. Shame on us for getting your, forgetting to forget. If we, ever, if we ever forget that you're someone's child and that you are just the embodiment of a family's hopes and dreams here, if we forget that, then we shouldn't be doing this job. It's that simple. It really is. It's not, it's not more complicated than that. All right. So which ones, based on your major, where you want to work, what you want to do, and your citizenship can fit your life? And then lastly, make a list of all the employers that would fit the criteria for these uh, visas. And once you make your list, you start networking. Because remember... Human beings give human beings jobs. You don't get a job from a computer by sending in your resume. No, 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 no. So that's a thing, and I have a whole video about that. 
how to answer immigration questions during the job search. If you're in IT or a job you can do remotely, this organization, and I, I, I'm not affiliated with them in any way, I just admire them because they're filled, this is an organization filled with people under 40, young, smart, innovative people who are not limited by systems. They think beyond a system with their creativity and their imagination. So they've invented a company and they're doing pretty well that um, offers technical consulting services all over the world. But what does that really mean? It means this, you go to get started, you click up there. If you are in OPT, and you're a tech major, which is a remote, you could do the work remotely. If your OPT employer cannot get you an H-1B and you still want to work with that employer and that employer loves you, these people will hire you and you go to work in Canada for Mob Squad. You go work for them. And then what does Mob Squad do? They turn right around and they send you to work with your OPT employer as a consultant. You work with your employer, not for the employer. You work with them from Canada. Now, how does that work? The employer on OPT pays a higher hourly rate for your services, but because you're a consultant, all the taxes and all the employee benefit costs are on mob squad. So you show up as an expense in the books of your OPT employer. You don't show up as a personnel expense, a payroll expense. You're just a consulting expense. And all the taxes affiliated with your pay are taken care of in Canada by these people. And now why is this good? Because you can work remotely from Canada with other people just like you. And they have really modern, cool offices. And then you can come to America as a business visitor from Canada to do whatever you need to do in personal face-to-face -face meetings with your former OPT employer. What does this get you in the long run? What does it get you? It gets you a Canadian green card after you get the Canadian work visa. And then they get you the Canadian work visa. It gets you the Canadian work visa, which leads to the Canadian green card. And then a mere four years total, I think it is, four years total, you become a Canadian citizen. Now, you're four years into this post-OPT work. And what happens? You're now you're a Canadian citizen. Now, why is that important? Well, because if you're a Canadian citizen, you have more green you have more visas to use on the way to the american green card a canadian citizen can use a tn an america canadian citizen can use an e1 or an e2 to come work in america so you get two more choices in this oval simply by being a canadian citizen and you be a canadian citizen by working four years for mob squad and you don't miss a beat you don't miss a paycheck that sounds pretty good to me so check that out if you're ever getting frustrated with America, and I wouldn't blame you if you were, check them out. They will solve your problem. You might never want to come back from Canada. They've got offices three. I think it's one in uh, uh, Vancouver, one in uh, Toronto or Montreal, and then one over like the Halifax way out, out, out east somewhere. Um, okay, um, enough of that. Now let's look over here the work visas what are these well the first one is the h1b with the lottery what's an h1b and remember all the details are in the numbered slides below um but what's an h1b an h1b is a visa that you're allowed to get if you have at least a four-year college degree or higher that's it that's it you go to get a four-year college degree in Japan, you can apply in America for an H-1B. Will you get it? There's only, there's only 85,000, I don't know. Half a million people want one. But the H-1B is requires you to have a four-year college degree, number one, or higher. That four-year college degree or higher is required by the job. 
and um, the company that offers you the job is financially stable so they don't go out of business tomorrow. Um, now, if you want to avoid the H-1B lottery, take a look at the types of employers. There's only three types of employers that are exempt from this lottery. And they are, here they are, type one, every United States college or university. So if you're doing postdoc research, they can get you a temporary H-1B any time because the H-1Bs for universities are not restricted. There's no quota. There's no, no lottery. They can't get you the green card as a postdoc because you're being funded by grant money, which will go away eventually. So you can't get a green card based on a job that'll go away. Um, number two, if you work for a nonprofit that's affiliated with a university or a college, like a teaching hospital, UVA, UVA Medical Center, Duke University Medical Center, the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and so on and so on. Research foundations that sit on the college campus. Here's a good one. You want to be a teacher? You want to go teach in high school? You want to teach children like kindergarten? You want to teach high school physics? If you want to teach high school, high schools are nonprofit and they're affiliated with colleges and universities through cooperative programs. High schools, high schools often send their smart seniors to take mathematics and science classes at the university level at the local university. And they get college credit and, and high school credit. Um, the colleges and universities send education majors into the public schools to learn how to be student teachers. And then eventually they graduate, they've been student teaching, and then they become real teachers. They, they become real teachers once they get their teaching license. So number one and number two, they're just like, give me, give me, give me, give me. And the third one is a nonprofit research organization, pure research, nonprofit. And it's things like a think tank, a public policy research organization, a trade association. Um, and these will give you four examples of what I'm talking about for type three. Take a look at these. And if anybody is in the audience from Chile, Singapore, or Australia, they basically, each country has H-1Bs secretly set aside for them that nobody tells you about. Uh, the Chilean and Singaporeans, they get an H-1B-1. They added the number one here, H-1B-1. And their um, visas behave like cap exempt because there's a set aside of the regular limited H-1B, there's a set aside that is always too big for the number of people in Chile or Singapore who want one. So if you're from one of these two countries and you want an H-1B, you can get it at any time with no limit. Um, Australia has an H-1B, but it's called an E-3 because it's a treaty based, it's treaty based, and it's only for Australian citizens. How do you get it? You go look up at the E3 requirements and it says you must be an Australian citizen and you must satisfy all the requirements for an H1B. And if you do that, you get an E3. An E3. What? What kind of system is this? What? Um, all right. So back here, the G next. The G visa is for those non-governmental organizations like the World Bank, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, um, the African um, Development Bank, the um, um, International Committee of the Red Cross. If you're interested, they hire people with masters and PhDs these organizations, but they're good places that do good work. And you can really make a difference in the emerging world by controlling disease, by building infrastructure to deliver clean water, to do what the governments in the countries cannot do for themselves, 
because probably the elected officials are dictators and they're looting they're looting the country blind so the g visa organizations step in uh, they even help fund ports for cargo delivery and exporting it's good work agricultural work you have a whole department of agriculture on campus i love that i mean i, I just love it there's this giant building it says agriculture and and you're doing wonderful stuff with um uh, increasing the yield of a crop it's really cool stuff um l1a we talked about this the l1a is connected to the top priority row of the green card through employment and if you lose the h1b lottery but you're working for a multinational then you can come back after staying overseas for a year so you work in america for opt you lose the lottery they love you they take you after opt and put you outside america now you're working outside america and when you come back you come back as an l1 intra company transfer e and the trick here is putting some multinationals on your list because if you get an opt offer from a multinational you know that this is out there in addition to the h1b if you put some universities and colleges on your list you don't have to be the professor you could be the finance guy you could be the, the young lady doing social work at the student clinic you, you you don't have to be the professor and if you lose the h1b lottery put some put some h1b lottery exempt cap exempt employers on your search list look for those you might not be it might not be your dream job but it's a job and it gets your foot in the door of our workforce the g visa put a few g visa organizations on your list you're studying engineering go work with a g visa organization that builds infrastructure roads soccer stadiums ports ports for cargo delivery and shipment l1 put multinationals on your list walmart google louis vuitton r1 is for religious work if you want to be a religious worker you need to find an organization that is based on the religion that you personally believe in so if you're a, a baptist go get a job at a Baptist organization, including a church. If you're Muslim, go get a job at a uh, mosque. We had a young lady in East Texas. East Texas looks a lot like Louisiana. I don't even know why there's a mosque there. I, I, whoa, I'd be freaking out. But this woman taught the small little children in the mosque school. She taught little kids Arabic, she taught them about Muslim Muslim country uh, culture, and she taught them um, about the Quran. And that education was in a religious organization that matched her religious belief. Ding, 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 ding. Living in East Texas, you could throw a rock and hit Louisiana, get in a M M Muslim mosque based R1, thank you if you asked me that 10 years ago could that ever happen i would i wouldn't know what to tell you now i know the answer is yes um and then down here these are odd but 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 useful O one is for extraordinary ability you've got to be among the best in your field so the o visa is based on your ability you as a human are you the best violin player in the world if you are you can get an 01 as long as you have a job offer. Or how about a P visa? Are you a D1 athlete? Are you um, a, the, <laughs> a starting linebacker for the Razorbacks? And do you get a job offer at the at the at the the minor uh, uh, um, entry level uh, uh, NFL football franchise? of your choice so if you're a, a, a fantastic d1 razorback running back you get a job at the um, i don't know the um new york jets <laughs> you get a job at the new york jets you can get a p visa for performer athlete 
the violin player can also get a P visa, but the, is, the, the P visa isn't based on her being the best violin player. It's based on the reputation of who hires her. So the reputation of the New York Jets, it's an NFL team, you get the P visa because the Jets hired you. She would get the violin P1, not because the Jets hired her, but because of symphony orchestra, the, the New York Symphony Orchestra hired her. The, um, the uh, Seattle, Washington Symphony Orchestra hired her. Um, and then these three with the, with, the, um, with the citizenship, the E3 is for Australians, the TN is for anybody who's from Canada, a citizen, a citizen of Canada or a citizen of Mexico. And you can see how the TN works. There's a slide on it. And then the E1 and E2, real quick, this is a gift if it's applicable in your case. There's a list of countries. So here's the E1. This is import, export. It's a trader. E2, any other type of organization in America where money has been invested in America, the treaty says, hey, look, if you find a job in America with a company that's owned by a company with your citizenship, you can go work there just because you're alive and you're a citizen of your home country. So if you wake up every day at um, University of Arkansas and you're Japanese, you got a Japanese passport. Go look for jobs at Mitsubishi, Kawasaki, um, um, Komatsu, uh, Toyota, Honda, uh, Panasonic, Sony. Go look for a job with a Japanese company. You get the job offer. You can go work there just because you're alive and just because you're Japanese. It's like a gift from God. Now, if you want to start your own company, you got to put in about 100000 thousand dollars a little more and now you own a company or your parents own a company in america what company nationality is that well the company's citizenship in america is owned by nationals of uh, japan and say you are uh, in that family it's either your money or your parents coincidentally you're japanese so you can start a company with your mom and dad and you can go work for your own company with an E because you're Japanese and the company in America you started is Japanese. Why? Because your family started it. They're all Japanese. Who gets you the visa? You get your own visa. I'm telling you, it's like magic. So, so, so contact me. And here's the list of countries real quick. And then maybe we'll have time for questions. <laughs> two minutes, two minutes of questions, guys. Um, here's the list of countries. Right. So Albania, how many Albanian owned companies are there in America? You'd have to do a, an Internet search and figure it out. But Argentina, Armenia, Australia, Austria, Azerbaijan. So all these citizens of all these countries have an extra choice in the gray box for the E1 import export or e2 uh like like honda toyota they invest a lot of money in manufacturing uh you, you can get a job with one of them uh where's where's china did i skip that china is really on here but it doesn't mean mainland china it means taiwan and we had a kid who was in the import export business I'm, well, let me finish the list here first. The kid was in the import export business with his mother. The mother starts an LLC in America for the purpose of what? Buying jewelry. Buying jewelry. Where? At estate sales. What's a kid know about jewelry? He didn't know anything. The other person in the American company that the mother started from Taiwan is the mother's gentleman friend. And the gentleman friend was an appraiser. So the appraiser and the kid on the weekends when he should have been doing his homework, they're going to estate sales. You cannot make this up. You cannot make this up. They're going to estate sales 
looking for bargain priced, mispriced, valuable jewelry at bargain basement prices because the heirs of the dead person just want the stuff out of the estate. So they buy, they buy like $3,000 watches for like 200 bucks. And then they get it refurbished in Taiwan by the mother. They send all the jewelry, all the watches, they send it back to Taiwan and they're making in profit like $400,000 a year. Like what? And the kid graduates and what does he do? He gets an E2 visa from his mother's Taiwan owned company in America and his job is full-time working with the gentleman friend of mom in America. And then using that E2 visa, well, that was a stepping stone to buy him time to find a job that would be his day job to pay the bills. But it bought him time. So what did we learn there? These businesses don't have to be fancy. And there's a lot of ways to make a lot of money in a really, really screwball, not glamorous way. The gentleman friend of mom and the kid were making $400,000 a year profit with, with mom included, splitting $400,000 three ways. And that turned out to be enough of trade volume to qualify for the E1 Export-Import Treaty Visa based on the import volume of dead people watches and jewelry from the United States to Taiwan. And with that, I think that that sums it up. You talk about imagination and creativity, that's brilliant. And I would have never thought of that. The people think of it and they tell me about it. And then I tell you, because I can't believe it happened. It's like so weird. Um, what do you think, Audra? We ran out of time, huh? Um, I've got us at 4.30, so that still gives us another about almost half an hour for questions. And... Oh, okay. Now, what can you see? Are we looking at the slides or the screen? Uh, we're looking at, uh, you're not sharing your screen any longer. Oh, I, I went through the whole presentation with no slides shown? Oh, no, we, we saw the slides as you were going through, but... Okay. Did you see the pile of money for the E1 and the E2? Did you see this one? No, no. Uh, so I went through the whole list of countries and no one saw it. Um, that's what I don't like about teams. I lose track of where I am and it doesn't show me what I'm seeing. And what I'm seeing should be what you're seeing. Um, all right. So let me go back. I'm sorry, guys. Can you see that? There we go. Yeah. All right. So this is the E1 and the E2. You click here and this is the treaty list and I was reading it along with you, except you didn't see it. So here, Albania, Argentina, Armenia, Australia. Yeah. Actually, we did see those. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. good. All right. Then I'm more on the ball than I thought I was. I'm, I'm, uh, Audra, I'm losing my mind. Look at me, I'm old. Um, <laughs> and we did have a question in the chat. Uh, someone asked if they could have a copy of the PDF in the recorded seminar. Uh, because it contains a lot of information, which it does. This is lots of information. This is wonderful. And so um, I will, I'm just letting everyone know, after the presentation, Mr. Ceratelli is going to send me the slides. And if you would like to get a copy of the presentation and the slides, please email iss at uark.edu, and we'll be glad to send those to you. And if you want, you could also just email Mara and me uh, mm -hmm. at you know, these email addresses. And then at least you'll have our email in your email if you ever want to try to find us in the future. Or you'll have a screenshot of this picture. You can put it in your you know, photo storage up in the cloud. So between Audra's office and us, all we want, we're, it takes a village to raise uh, 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 a UARC uh, international student. So Audra's got you covered. And we'll try to pitch in where Audra's job stops. We'll try to pick up where Audra leaves off. And that's how you reach us. So I'll have the slides available too. But I'm going to send them to Audra right as soon as we're done. Um, okay, so that's one question. What else we got? Anything else? You don't, you don't have to be shy. Yeah, go ahead. Hola. In, oh, any Ola, Ola. 
Is that right? I'm sorry, I'm messing up your name. Oops. Hit the wrong um, one. I'm so sorry. I knew that by mistake, but I do have a question. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. I wanted to see if you could talk a bit about the national interest waiver and the EB1, EB2. Okay. So this young lady is asking about the green card that you get for yourself. In other words, if I can rely on me and not HR of some organization to secure my future in America, I'd rather sponsor me than have some HR employee at my employer sponsor me. Um, so the requirement to get into this box is a PhD or a master's. If you have a master's, we'll, 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 we'll analyze whether it's a strong enough case but normally, if the king of the hill in this box is a PhD and the other people in that same box have masters or they have a bachelor's, but they argue that they are exceptional. And that simply means when you compare this bachelor's person to other people with the similar bachelor's credentials, this person is light years ahead of them. This person is like Albert Einstein and these other people are just like run of the mill bachelor's people, you're gonna realize the PhD is a huge advantage in this box. So number one, do they look for PhDs? Yeah. Do you have to have a PhD? No, but the evidence, and if you want a list of the evidence you need to show to win in this box, just email me and I'll send you, it's like a worksheet. It's got eight categories of, evidence that you could present to the government and the more the better i know their website says oh you need three of the following eight pieces of evidence but if you have eight give eight don't give three if you have five give five the more the better um but the twist here is your work has to be in the national interest because it's important so what's important work? Well, Biden took the mystery out of it. If it's on that list of critical and emerging technologies, all of them in STEM, you, you win. You've already proven the first two bullets. Your work's important because of what it is, and it's important all over America. Biden already declared that for you. Then the only thing you got to prove is that you personally are working to expand the body of knowledge in the field. You're doing unique things that contribute unique new ideas to the field. And normally that's what a PhD is. It's a new idea that you're writing a thesis about. And because of these three bullets up here, the fourth bullet is my problem. We have to explain to the government why we should just hand you a green card instead of forcing you to go through this purple box where the young lady in the cartoon is going, shh. In other words, this box is almost like purgatory. I was gonna say hell, it's not that bad, purgatory. This box, because you control your own life, is tedious. The work is tedious to find the evidence and get letters of rep recommendation but you can do it and you don't have to be stem we had a guy in this no we had a guy up in this box you know what his job was i'm not making this up either he was working for a child's software company that taught children the basics the alphabet how to put sounds together then with those sounds you make words you make words that make sentences and then you tell stories with sentences it was a comprehensive, use, use as you grow, age appropriate software series that also then branched out into merchandise. They had the characters in the software were featured on pajamas, were featured on uh, backpacks and so on and so on. It was a marketing juggernaut. This guy negotiated for that company he negotiated multi-million dollar contracts with department stores, Target, Walmart, Kohl's, K-H-O-L. I don't know if you have those down where you are. Belk, um, that's another one. Um, the, the point is you could be really, really, really good at what you do up here. 
he was really, really, really good in business. And then you know what he did? After he negotiated these multi-million dollar deals for his employer, he gets the green card with his wife and they open up an Indian artisan cheese manufacturing facility and the cheese is cut to put in something called something paneer. It's like a spinach dish the Indian people um, make. It's on all the menus, but he became an artisan Indian cheese maker. I mean, I, I, you can't make this up. But anyway, that's what this box is. You work in the national interest. You're a STEM major. If you're not a STEM major, then we have to go through the drill of proving what you do is important and why. For example, an economics student one year came to us and said, I know I'm economics. There's economic, there's economics uh, students, and they're a dime a dozen, but I'm using economics to prove that if you don't have trays in the cafeteria and you make the kids get up and down to refill for seconds, or, or, or if they have to get dessert, they got to get up and go get it, they'll eat less. And if they eat less, their weight goes down. And if they weight goes down, diabetes goes down, da -da -da, the blood pressure goes down. So the kid was using economics in the behavioral sciences for the overall welfare of American, American healthcare and the well being of the population. That was one of the coolest ever NIWs I've ever done because the kid was really unique applying principles of economics to getting up and down in the cafeteria to go get another ice cream cone. Are you kidding me? You guys blow my mind. I love working with you because you're all so darn smart and you're all so dedicated to what you do. It's so hopeful. It really is. People in my neighborhood, my age, ugh, I got no time for that. I got no time for that. Except if I lived in Audra, Audra's neighborhood when I retire, I would take care of her cat when she went out of town. I would do that. Um, and up here, you have to be among the best at what you do. And it could be anything. It could be playing the piano. It could be, it could be negotiating contracts for software and pajamas. It could be anything. So does that help you? It might help if you email me and I send you the criteria of evidence categories to see how much of the stuff you already have. And then we could use it like a worksheet to figure out what you still need. Would that help? Yes, that sounds good. So email me and I'll send you the list, the worksheet that we fill in all the credentials you have so far, your papers, your publications, any achievements other than that. And there's lists of categories. We'll fill it out using your accomplishments now and compare it to what we should have to win a case. You might already have it all. If not, we will figure out the path of least resistance. So from right now, from right now, you simply do everything in your power to accomplish two things with one activity. The next thing you do should advance your career, advance your progression to graduation, and it should advance your ability to get your own green card. So from now on, everything you do better be academic and practical for the green card or else you're wasting your time. And wouldn't it be nice to know that now with a concrete list of stuff than to shoot in the dark and just worry about it? You know, there's free floating anxiety. I have enough of that on my own. Helping you reduce your anxiety <laughs> ironically helps me reduce mine because it takes my mind off of me and puts it on you. So. <laughs> I would love to help you. Just email me. Yeah, that's great, Art. Uh, I want to look at a couple more questions that we got in the chat. Okay. And the first one is, someone asked, how different is this process for a J1 scholar? Nah. All right, Audra. So let's do this. Let's tell the general parameters of a J1 scholar, how long they're here with the J to be a scholar? Do they get any time after the scholar program is over to stay and work? I think it's called academic training. Audra tells us the basics of that. And then what happens after academic training, I could chip in. So this is where it takes a village. And Audra goes first because she knows more about it than I do. 
Okay, so I will say that um, for J1 scholars, and here at, at University of Arkansas, when we say scholar, we mean someone who is not enrolled in academic classes. So um, if you're a J1 student, then you would qualify for academic training, which is what Art mentioned. It's kind of similar to optional practical training for F1 students. But for scholars, if you're in, say, the research scholar category, um, then you have up to five years. You're probably already employed. And I think one of the things that I think of that comes to mind for me is many of our J-1 scholars might be subject to the two-year home residence requirement. And so, Art, can you speak a little bit to, um, to how that um, two-year home residence might impact being able to get a green card, for example? Okay. So if you have a two-year, so, so the J-1 is an exchange visitor. What are we exchanging? We're exchanging you from your country to America, we give you some experience here, knowledge, work, whatever, and then you go back and the reverse exchange from America to your home country, you go back and tell everybody all the great things you learned and did here, right? It's kind of antiquated. I won't make fun of Fulbright, that's one program for the J. I won't make fun of it because there's statues of the guy all over campus, but it's a little antiquated. You want to tell somebody how great America is? Post it on Instagram or on Facebook, right? You got to go home. So the point is, this might be a Cold War era leftover, but if you've got to go home, then you cannot get any further progress in our immigration system toward visas that lead you to the green card because J-1 is a temporary visa. And the only place you can go from a temporary visa that has a rule that says you eventually have to stay in your home country for two years. The only way you can get from that to something else, you get another temporary, like a like an F1, but you still have this two year rule hanging over your head. So there's certain ways to get rid of it. One, go home for two years, just plan that into your life. If that's a huge inconvenience, you might've thought it was feasible up front. And then in your five years on Audra's campus, you meet somebody, fall in love, and now there's children and a spouse. Ah, what do you do? You got little American sh uh, children running around. You're going to take them back to Moldova? Uh, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of upset. So what do you do? You can get, except for Fulbright, they're strict, but you could try to get a waiver of the two-year rule, meaning if the, okay, so how do you get a two-year rule? The two-year rule is if your government or our government pays for, funds your J-1 experience, your J-1 program. So Fulbright is the American government sponsoring the costs of your J-1 experience here, and they pay maybe, they pay uh, the tuition, they pay your airplane fare, they pay, pay for a ha apartment, who knows what they pay. But because our government is paying, we want you to go back. So getting a waiver from Fulbright is hard. But if your government paid for you to come here, and your government could not care less if you go back or not, then you get to request a no objection waiver which means your country doesn't care and they will state in writing, we have no objection. If this student ignores the two year rule, let them stay and make sure they earn a lot of dollars and send them back home to their mother and father. So they waive the rule and there's other ways to waive it other than this no objection from your home country. Say for example, you're using the J1 to be a medical doctor and you go work at the Veterans Association, the VA hospital. Now, the VA hospital, that's part of our government. Now, why should the VA hospital not get the benefit of your services? Because this Fulbright office in some other part of the government says you got to go home. Now, it's injured soldiers who are vet vets and they need health care fighting with Fulbright. Fulbright wants to send you home the VA hospital wants you to stay. That's called an interested government agency waiver. The VA 
it makes an argument that, hey, let Fulbright chill and let us have that doctor. And there are ways to do that. So there's all kinds of ways to waive the two-year rule, but you can't advance further until you get the two years dealt with. You either work them off and go back home, and you can work them off in bits and pieces, or meaning you don't have to go home for two years straight. You can go home and do something else, and then go back home. Adds up to two years home. You stay, and then you've fulfilled your requirement or get it waived. Okay. Um, and, and that's what we normally help with the very first thing, if you're J1 with no with no two-year rule, then everything in this presentation applies. But if you're J1 with a two-year rule, the very first thing we do is have to figure out how to get rid of that two years. And mm -hmm. then we could talk about all these crazy work visas and the green card and so on. Because if you don't fulfill the two-year rule, you can't get you can't get much of anything else in the list I went over. Right. Okay. Thank you. And um, we have a couple more questions that I wanted to make sure we kind of squeeze in. And the first one from Irene uh, asks about, can we apply for an NIW while doing a PhD? And I'm thinking that this might be um, a question that's better suited for an email to you, Art, would you say so? Yeah. So Irene, if you would please send that question to Mr. Ceratelli by email, um, I'm sure he will be glad to address that for you. And then um, Andrian had said, hello, I missed a lot of it, but I believe form I-485 for, for the green card doesn't necessitate a foreign individual to be on F-1 status, correct? Um, and so my understanding from what you said earlier, Art, was that you don't have to be in F-1 status to move to a green card. And it, especially like you don't have to be on OPT to go to a green card. Is that correct? Right. You can be in America lawfully in any status. It could be F1. It could be a work visa. And when you're in the line for the green card and you get to that third step, the I-485, that keeps you here legally in addition to whatever other status you have. And once you get in line at the I-485 stage, then we have a discussion do you want to drop your current status when it expires or do you want to keep it alive? Some people like it as a backup. So they have two ways to stay here legally. Other people don't care and they roll the dice and they just stick with the 485. But yeah, that's the answer is what Audra said. Okay. We have time for maybe one more question. Does anyone else have a question for Mr. Saratelli? Okay. Well, Art, thank you so much for this very informative presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Again, if you would like a copy of the presentation or the slides, um, if you'd like the presentation, email iss at uark.edu. We can send you a link to the recording. Um, and then if you just want the slides, you can email us or you can email Mr. Saratelli and we'll be glad to, someone will be glad to make sure those get to you. Okay, so, and then we have one last one. How about getting green card through IWA? Um, Ahmed, let me ask you to email Mr. Saratelli with that question. Um, Tell me what IWA stands for. Yes, yes, that's. Yeah, so um, feel free to, to email him. I know he is very helpful. I can I can vouch for him. He is very helpful, very responsive, and we appreciate him so much. Aww. So, Art, we hope that you have a wonderful evening, and International Education Week is coming up, so happy International Education Week. Um, we actually, this is, is part of our International Education Month, slate of activities. And so I'm going to put in a plug for International Education Week. Um, you can go to, I'm going to drop the link in the chat. You can go to iew.uark.edu to find other events that we have going on. And again, Art, thank you so much. And we appreciate you. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.